Welcome everyone that is here with us. We have got a super cool meetup. This is the first of a hopefully very long uh, tradition of meetups that we're going to be doing that are around the engineering labs. We've got not one, not two speakers. We've got like five different talks that we're going to be having. So this is like legit meetup territory here. It's not just one long talk. Hopefully it's going to be dynamic and it's going to be interesting for everyone. Uh, I'm going to be bringing people in and out as we go. So uh, for the moment now, for the time being, while you all are here with us, if you want to just let us know where you're tuning in from, Give us that in the chat. You can hopefully uh, type in the chat, like, where where are you in the world? That's always fun to see and see if anybody else is watching from the same city as you or country. Now I've got uh, a little musical intro for the crew. <laughs> this is uh, hopefully going to be all right, but don't get your hopes up too much going to be mainly around the engineering labs that we've had. We've got some cool stuff. Niels and Haytham, I'm going to trust you to tell me. Can you hear the guitar? Is everybody cool with E? E major? signed up a few different teams finished the best ones we've got for you it's the top three team artifact team brave hyena and vamos dale You're gonna hear from all of them You're gonna hear what they liked and what they didn't You're gonna see their GitHub repos Hopefully you can reproduce it on your free, 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 free time Welcome to the MLOps community meetup that we are doing with flight and thank you all for joining this virtual meetup today great to have you here thank you it's good to see you all i am excited to get started and i know we don't have that much time so hayton you're first up man i'm gonna give it to you do you want to, uh, let's yep. see if I can, oh, ooh, ooh. I don't think I can see your um, screen because we've got too many people in the waiting room. I got to kick somebody out. Okay. Uh, sorry, person who is this. All right, now let's try your screen. There we go. Oh, cool. right. yeah, thank you. I can see it. Uh, so hi everyone, and thank you, Dimitris, for the lovely intro. Uh, <laughs> my name is Haytham Elfto. I am one of the co-authors of Flight, and I work with Niels in Union, uh, where we work on Flight and um, more innovative ways of making it even easier to run um, and host. Uh, I will be talking today about uh, Flight, and I understand that some people here are familiar uh, with what Flight is, and some are not. So we'll try to talk a little bit 
uh, high level about some of the concept of light, um, and then we can dig deeper into um, uh, you know some of the internals, uh, so we can you know see how light works and how it runs uh, tasks and workflows. Uh, to start off, uh, this is how we define Flight. It's a Kubernetes native workflow automation platform for business critical machine learning and data processes at scale, very mouthful. Um, but hopefully it will become a lot simpler as we you know, uh, uh, dissect each part here. Uh, so to start off, what is a workflow? Uh, we think of a workflow as uh, you know, a set of tasks uh, that you want to, or processes that you want to orchestrate um, uh, on against, you know, some piece of work uh, or some workload, some piece of data um, or a set of data um, items or rows. Um, and you want some guarantees with that. You want to make sure when you click one off that it completes, uh, whether that's success or failure, you want to make sure it will finish. Uh, you want to make sure you can see that, you can get notified, observable, you should, you should have some control of how it runs and where it runs. Um, but as a user, you shouldn't really have to worry about uh, the, plat the, the, you know, the infrastructure or how do I you know, reserve machines and you know, all of these fun stuff. Uh, we can abstract away all of this and let you just focus on writing your logic. Um, I have a note here down there for uh, uh, visitors. We get that question a lot. Uh, what's a DAG? What isn't a DAG? And there are some competitors, I guess, that talk about you know this the death of a DAG and, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is sort of our take on this. Um, we, when you are authoring a workflow, you shouldn't really have to get the, be restricted uh, in how you define the processes. Yes, you can have loops, uh, even though DAGs cannot have loops. Um, you should be able to, you know, sort of re repeat a certain process or set of processes for every like row of an input. Um, yet you should that construct should be available. You shouldn't really have to uh, change the way you think of the process just so you can write it as a flight workflow. Uh, so it should uh, uh, look intuitive. And if it isn't, please talk to us. We we strive to make it as intuitive as we can. Um, but when we say the DAG, what we really mean is when at runtime, when everything materializes, when inputs are there, when we know the graph and we know everything, but at runtime when we're executing things, we are executing a DAG. Uh, so if it's a loop, you know, like a 10 uh, items loop or something, then that will get flattened out and you have, you know, sort of the repeated process 10 times. Uh, we know that uh, at runtime and then it will get executed this way. There are many benefits of executing DAGs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are. Uh, at a high level, it gives you reproducibility and observability, so you can make sure you can, um, uh, the thing you defined runs as expected every single time you run it. Uh, we focus a lot in flight uh, on the user experience, um, and we want to make sure we are there to help you from the time you are still experimenting, you are uh, you know playing with the like some concepts that you want to uh, prototype, uh, all the way to you know I'm now ready to take it to the next level and scale my uh, you know workflow, my code uh, to I want to run it in production and again it's like real data and on a schedule, uh, so like retrain uh, and trigger retraining for models and data processes when you know other things happen and so on. Um, we want to be there at every point in that user journey and add value, not just be there to force you to write things a certain way, but uh, make your life easier, um, increase the velocity of your development um, and make it safe and reproducible uh, every step of the way. Uh, some high level uh, concepts we will keep referring to later on that they want to make sure we address uh, uh, early on, um, a task. We have a concept of a task is, uh, is our sort of smallest unit or of indivisible work. Um, and it can be arbitrarily large. It can be uh, just a SQL statement that you want to execute against the DB. It can be a container you want to run um, or like a Python function you want to run that takes just a, that like prints a statement uh, uh, or can run a very complex uh, computation, it cannot be a Spark job, so it can 
uh, also involve running, like scheduling other sort of containers to, to run this task. Um, can be a REST endpoint call, uh, can be anything, right? But the, the common thing between all of these uh, is the interface. So we have uh, Flight is sort of built on this construct that um, every unit of work you run has a strongly typed interface. We know the input types, we know the output types, um, we know, uh, you know what sort of kind of task it is, so we can select the appropriate way of running it. Uh, the way we will run you know, a REST call is not the same way we will run a SQL statement, it's not the same way we will run a pod, and so on and so forth. Um, but they will all take inputs, they will all do something, and they will all produce an output. Um, and we build on that construct to then uh, define a workflow. So a workflow then takes a bunch of these tasks and maybe other workflows um, and has its own interface on top. Uh, so now a workflow takes an input and then runs a graph uh, of tasks and other workflows and produce outputs. Um, the same thing, same sort of concept carries over with workflow and that's, that's why uh, they are composable. So you can, you know, workflow can call other workflows. Um, we see that a lot in companies that the, like you don't only write or run workflows that you own 100%. Um, you might be leveraging workflows that are written by other teams, are maintained by other teams, and published, and so on. Um, and the, the main difference between you know just sharing workflows as opposed to sharing maybe Python, PyPy libraries across you know the company uh, or across the industry is that uh, the the isolation guarantees here are a lot stronger. Um, there is no dependency conflicts you can run into if that library depends on some you know obscure version of pandas or something uh, you don't care you're just uh, you just care about the interface you make sure that I will produce data that can be consumed by that uh, shared you know workflow or a task um, and then I can uh, leverage or consume the outputs produced by that workflow or task uh, in subsequent steps uh, makes it so powerful to uh, also or maybe flexible to use across domain languages. So you can have your own DSL, you can use Python, you can use Java, Scala, we have SDKs in all of these languages, uh, but you can have your own. You can have some native um, uh, like container that you want to run that does specific thing for like, you know, I don't know, AV perception or something. Um, and as long as you can sort of wrap it to say this container takes these three things, these strings or pandas data frames or something and produce this for me, um, it can fit right into an existing workflow, maybe written entirely in Python. Um, and you don't have to worry about the translation between languages and again, dependencies and the right, you know, OS to run on and all of that. Uh, it's all encapsulated in these containers. Um, if you dig a little bit deeper into how you author one, uh, so this is a uh, you know, very simple workflow on the, on the right that has two functions that we marked as tasks, and then the at workflow is us telling the platform that this is a workflow. Um, so it, it then the expectation is that the code that you run, that you write in the workflow uh, will be some you know, Python logic plus some calling of other tasks and other workflows. Um, and it's up to you how you, when do you decide to mark something as a task, as a task versus maybe just a, a Python function. Um, uh, generally speaking, we, we like you should think of a task as this is, it can run independently. Um, it's maybe a functional, uh, like borrowing from some fu functional programming language concepts. Um, this doesn't have side effects. It can take inputs, these like you know these certain types of inputs, and produce an output, and uh, will always uh, will like, produce the same or equivalent output when given the same inputs. Um, and uh, and then I want to scale this task independently, right? So I'm okay running, you know, ten. Uh, instances of this task uh, on 10 different machines um, if you know if the system decided to to scale out um, and uh, and yeah if that happens then then, okay, then you have a task at hand uh, then you should mark it as a task uh, and write normal Python code in there right you can call other functions you can do whatever you want um, the, the the expectation is that you define 
the inputs, uh, input types and output types uh, on the task and that become makes it strongly typed, enables us to validate that, you know, calling functions uh, and calling tasks, calling workflows can pass the right uh, types. Um, one, and then the add task uh, uh, annotation uh, allows you many flags to pass in. The ones highlighted here um, are uh, uh, pertaining to caching. Uh, so there is a concept in flight uh, we call caching or memoization that uh, that you can leverage sort of automatically uh, marking a task as uh, or certain input of a task as cached. Uh, so if we saw it again, right? If somebody calls pay multiplier again, the same cached version and the same inputs, we will not run it again, right? It's very helpful for expensive tasks uh, if you are, you know, maybe running uh, some complex. SQL query or big query um, uh, against a big, like large data set, you don't have to rerun that same query again and again, right? If you change the data range or some like the inputs to the query, great, yes, it will automatically run again. But if somebody else in the company or you in your iterations uh, modified, you know, different a different task and you didn't touch this querying task, then why should you run it again? Um, and it's an opt-in feature uh, because we noticed that people in uh, reality uh, a lot of times have side effects uh, within their tasks. Um, so yeah, so you mark a task as a task, you write a function as a task and a couple of other ones. And then the workflow, you just you know, orchestrate these. Uh, and this is it. The, the, the uh, platform will then take your code and it will understand the data flow. It will understand how you are consuming the inputs of a workflow and which tasks can run independently, uh, and it will construct this uh, DAG for you. Um, once you know you do like iteratively run this uh, locally on your like Python VM, you might decide to then okay, I'll take it the next step and run it on you know the cluster because they want to run it on real data or bigger data sets or you know whatever the requirements are. Um, you can then say, uh, you can add annotations on the tasks to specify exactly which ones you want, uh, you know, maybe more CPU to and which ones are memory bounds so I will add more memory to. Um, and you don't have to just pick like the max of, you know, resources that you will ever need within a workflow, wasting resources and leaving, you know, uh, CPUs idle and so on and so forth. Um, you can scope down exactly when you need resources for which tasks um, and, uh, and then in the system will you flight along with Kubernetes scheduler, figure out where to run your tasks to, for uh, maximum efficiency. Uh, another thing here the, in the middle, you can define tasks that are not just, uh, will not just run Python, right? They could run, in this case, a Spark job. Uh, and this is a containerized Spark job. So you will, um, uh, the, the system at runtime will start up a cluster, a Spark cluster, given the Spark config you provide, right? In this case, it just uh, specify the memory uh, requirement for the driver in Spark. If you're familiar with Spark, it has you know, drivers, the driver and the set of executors. You can define specs for how many executors, how much memory each one should have, and so on. You can define all the Spark configs here, and then the system will start a Spark cluster for you, run your uh, job, right? Given the sort of, in this case, the, the data frame, um, let it process it, produce an output, and then you can consume it in anywhere else outside of Spark. Um, it's very powerful to, uh, to be able to tie uh, different execution engines together this way. Um, so you can pick the best of all worlds, right? If you are doing BigQuery for your data querying or some data uh, transformations, and then Spark for some processing, some, right? You don't have to, uh, pick only one of them and then translate all your logic to it uh, uh, because it will not be the most efficient, it will not be the most maintainable or intuitive for you or other people who will maintain this code later. Um, so Flight will give you this ability to just completely disconnect and just pick the best plugin or the best way to execute uh, a certain you know, workload. And it will take care of the glue between them. Um, Another thing to note here, if you haven't, uh, this first task produces a pandas data frame. The next task takes in a PySpark data frame. Um, and again, 
you don't have to uh, take care of the transformation. Flight has a type system um, that helps you with all of the uh, the basic, at least, uh, or the common transformations we noticed in 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 real life. Um, you, it's very extensible. You can add more types to it. You can share those with you know the rest of your the company. Um, and uh, uh, and even if they don't have, if, let's say, I create a new uh, completely new type uh, within my you know workflow. Uh, I can, and I will be able to use it. Uh, if somebody else starts consuming my workflow and they don't have that type, they will still get, they, it will not just break, right? It will give them the sort of basic type behind the type I created um, as, you know, the, the type they can use. And if they want the more specialized logic that you provided, then they can refer to your custom type. Uh, so far, what we have been talking about is this ad workflow, which is what, which, what we call is uh, a static, statically evaluated graph. Uh, so at compile time, and we'll talk about what compilation is uh, next, uh, you, we figure out the data flow for the workflow and taking the inputs, passing it to this task, and then this task takes the outputs and so on and so forth. Um, we do all of that at compile time statically. Uh, and it's very powerful because then it gives you visualizations before running any code, and you can, you know, sort of uh, uh, check if if your logic makes sense and so on. Um, but in a lot of cases, you don't know the exact graph you want to run uh, until later at runtime. Uh, so there is another construct at flight called at dynamic, uh, in which allows you to defer the 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 computation of the graph of the workflow to at runtime. Uh, so in this case, on the right here, I have another, another Python function that marked as at dynamic, it takes you know three lists of data frames um, and produces uh, a list of lists. It can run predictions. Uh, it can like produce predictions on the uh, the train event and test data sets. Um, and we don't know beforehand how many items there will be at runtime, right? So it doesn't make sense to statically compute this graph at, at, uh, at compile time. Um, so in here, I can run any, again, Python logic. Uh, I can run if conditions, complex if conditions, loops, and so on, um, on the evaluated or materialized inputs. And then uh, call, you know, in this case, fit and predict our uh, flight tasks. Uh, so when the system sees that, it will not actually call fit. It will not call predict. It will just remember that you want to call fit and predict with these inputs. Um, and then once the, the function is done, once it returns, um, then we have the materialized graph that you actually want to run. Uh, and this is where we will you know, the, uh, start executing it, just like uh, uh, a statically defined workflow, but it's defined, you know, at a later point. Um, gives you, again, very powerful extensibility points, uh, dynamism in your workflows, uh, but still guaranteeing all the, the, the predictability and reproducibility uh, guarantees we give for statically generated workflows. Um, Interaction-wise, you can obviously write your code, again, with uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks, you can interact with the executions, you can retrieve inputs, outputs, and so on. Um, you can do exactly the same thing with the CLI tools. It's very friendly for DevOps. If you have, you know, a CI system where you want, you know, every code change would kick off uh, an execution and make sure it runs correctly or something like that, uh, very friendly to do so. Um, flight also ships with a UI component. We call it Flight Console. On the uh, left and right, these are slightly two different uh, windows uh, from Flight Console. On the left here is like a workflow view, which shows you the last a few uh, executions of that workflow and whether they succeeded or not and how long it took and so on. Um, and then on the, uh, on the right side, when you try to launch a workflow, we get this automatically generated uh, launch form. Um, and again, it's powered by the fact that a workflow or a task has a strong interface, strongly typed interface. So we know the, what inputs it take and we know what types those are. Uh, so we can render them in a more intuitive way for you to you know, uh, start launching workflows. Um, you get specific versions uh, of a workflow here. Uh, so every time you um, 
you compile and register a workflow or a task, you uh, get a new version. Uh, so all the all the items, I guess, within, within the system or all the artifacts within the system are immutable, uh, which allows you to go back in history or go back in time and rerun, you know, a successful workflow from two months ago um, and know that it will run exactly the same code that ran two months ago, um, uh, with hopefully producing the same outputs or equivalent outputs, I guess, for uh, training models. Uh, once things start running, you get this rendering of a graph. Um, and even for statically workflows, statically defined workflows, you can get the workflow at uh, a static time um, that shows you, you know, which nodes are running now, which ones succeeded. It can give you this nested view of uh, uh, workflows, right? When you have, uh, when you, if, you, if, if your workflow calls other workflows and so on, it can get nested here. Um, I can get, you can like drill deeper, see where the workflow is at at the moment. There are a couple of other views that I, I haven't uh, shared here. There's a timeline view. It's more listed and shows you the, just the, how long each task took. Um, there's this node view that shows you uh, just the uh, nodes as they start executing in a list view. Um, you also get errors. Uh, up there uh, in the in the UI, once you know a task fails, we pull up the code stack and you know error message and so on. Try to make it as uh, easy as possible for you to spot what the problem is. Um, like even with all the compilation that we do, we can't check your actual task code until we run it uh, at runtime. Uh, so errors will happen, uh, but hopefully this will. Uh, avoid you having to like you know figure out where the logs can be where like maybe talk to infrastructure folks or that are maintaining a cluster and you know dig for logs from that cluster and so on uh you should get it right here and uh and fix it iterate again and so on um for there are a few ways you can uh, uh, interact or get started, I guess, with, with flights. I want to talk first about this iterative uh, local approach, um, which would be the quickest way of uh, iterating over code that you're just starting up. You're just writing, you know, experimenting with flight or, or work, workflows. Um, you can do this by flight run your module. Uh, which would just compile and run locally, right, in within your Python uh, uh, environment. Uh, it's very quick. You still get type checking. Uh, you get some output visualization. Um, and you get caching and memoization locally. Uh, but you can do everything, right? There are a few things you cannot do, like uh, running relying on backend plugins. If you are running, you know, BigQuery uh, that has to run on an external system, you cannot do that locally, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, you can't run with you know different Docker images for different tasks, um, even though you know, right, the system does support that. You can do that locally. Uh, you cannot run these you know remote reference tasks and workflows locally. Uh, these are you know if, if somebody builds a task or a workflow and share it with you, give you just the like, the name of the, the ID of the task um, to use it within your workflow. You cannot just like, pull it and run it locally yet. Uh, we we. As I said, we are working on always uh, improving this UX. So if this becomes an important feature, let us know and we are uh, more than happy to um, reconsider. Um, once you're happy with this, you know, sort of fast iteration locally and you think you have a good a thing you want to run now remotely, maybe for or larger data sets or uh, different plugins that you want to use and so on, uh, you can just add this dash dash remote and the system will automatically um, add a step in this process, which is this registration step we'll talk about in a second, um, to run your package your code, ship it to remote cluster, uh, flight cluster, um, and then run it there. Uh, and you get a lot back, right? You will get uh, this extensive type checking, you will get full range of backend plugins, uh, you get a lot of visualizations in the UI, right? You get the graph and timeline view and you get the stack traces. You should be able to share these executions with other people in your org um, and so on. Um, skip that. Uh, uh, registration. Uh, so digging in the weeds here. Um, uh, the registration process is, uh, is the way we in flight make sure we build uh, this cross language uh, immutable 
artifact that we can, so like a closure of what you are running uh, that we can rerun later on. We can leverage in, you know, sharing and, and uh, reusing within languages, uh, across languages and so on. On the bottom left here is where you start, right? You're writing your code and then you do, you do two steps. Essentially, you build a container, you build a Docker container that has your dependencies, native dependencies, your codes, like everything you need for this task. Um, or maybe for the entire repo, you have just one image uh, that has all the tasks. Uh, you upload it to some container registry, and then the next step is this compilation step uh, where you we take your code, uh, we take the workflow, we analyze the statically de defined workflows, um, and we build uh, an intermediate language representation of those uh, in protobuf format. And then that is what gets uploaded to our like admin service, our control plane. Um, so this is how, you know, you can have a Python SDK and a Scala SDK and R SDK all producing the same format uh, that talks about, you know, the, the work, right? It has the interface, it has metadata about the task, it has the container information and so on. Uh, gets uploaded to, to the control plane uh, that gets, you know, further compiled, optimized. Uh, we, we can do some uh, optimizations on the, graph of the workflow uh, because it's again in our intermediate language uh, and then we store that uh, for runtime to pull up and uh, and execute this uh, the, the the that intermediate format it looks like something like the thing on the right side here so on the left you start with your code very simple there's one task and one workflow um, number two you build and push this image and three, you run this package command if you want to look at, you know, like introspect what was generated um, and you get this on the right side. This is like excerpts of what was generated. Um, there's these important three pieces. There is an ID and this is globally unique within the system. Um, it has, you know, your project domain and the name of a workflow in this case and a version. Uh, so if you ever change the code of the workflow, you cannot register uh, like the same version again. You have to invent a new version name or version string um, and we'll iterate that version. We encourage people to use Git chas for these because uh, you then automatically get uh, like versioning every time you iterate or you create a new commit, um, you automatically get a new version. And it has, you know, some, the, the spec of the task and, and, uh, and so on. There's a separate process we call fast registration, which is very similar to the registration step, but avoids the, the container build. We do recognize that this is not the favorite step that anyone wants to keep doing every time they you know, make a code change or add a log line. Um, so there is this very simple process um, where we leverage an existing Docker container and flight kit our SDK in Python ships with one, uh, but you might, you know, in your uh, repo, build one that has maybe your own dependencies that you rely on. Um, and then every time you change your code, you don't have to build that image again. You just reuse the image plus the new code. Um, and uh, the, the system has a tool, the, the CLI tool, uh, will automatically package and ship that code over to your blob store um, that, you know, is configured in the backend. Um, and then everything else will run exactly the same way. Your code at runtime will get pulled in, um, uh, and used instead of the code that exists in the image, but you will leverage the image to uh, uh, use the same requirements you have and the same dependencies and so on. So you skip over that. We also ship with this uh, uh, Docker container called Flight Sandbox that will give you the entire experience of a flight cluster running on your laptop or computer. Um, you can, you know, uh, run it with flight CTL sandbox start. Uh, there are a couple of newer ones faster to run. Uh, we will update the, the slides and the docs uh, on how to do that. But essentially, you get the entire experience. You get the UI, you get the, you know, the registration and the compilation. You get all of that um, in a box. Um, that is very powerful to iterate again and, and try out things, um, but it's limited by the limitations of your machine. Um, so, you know, you might lose data because everything is stored locally. Uh, the DB is stored locally, everything, right? Um, and, uh, and then the resources, you can scale beyond your machine. 
but it looks exactly the same as the, if I'm happy with this, I can take it to run on a real cluster uh, in the cloud provider uh, when scale, let it scale out, uh, be more reliable and so on. I'm running late here, so let me skip over this. Um, this is just a quick overview on the architecture of flight. Uh, uh, the, on the left side here is our control plane and, and clients. There are multiple clients you can interact with the system from, uh, whether you're in Jupyter Notebook or in CLI or in like ID or whatever, wherever you are, there is like some client you can interact with the system from. Uh, there's flight admin in, in the middle here. This is our control plane where we store metadata about the tasks and workflows that run and the executions and so on. And then on the right side, these blue boxes are the Kubernetes uh, clusters and you can run multiple clusters uh, if you want, you know, if, if scale is, uh, is desired, you can run different, uh, you can have some routing rules. These workflows go to these clusters and this is a whole story about how to manage these clusters, but Flight makes it super easy once you have the setup uh, up and running from a user perspective, they don't have to think about that. They're targeting this single endpoint to schedule, register, and run, and execute, and uh, introspect their, their uh, executions. Um, and Flight will take care of managing all of these clusters in the backend. Let's skip over that. Um, features, yeah. Uh, so just a quick recap, uh, Flight provides these uh, basic constructs to guarantee reproducibility and uh, observability for workflows, uh, allows you to scale up your workflows um, as you know data come in and uh, uh, as needed. Um, there is a very easy interaction model to start. Uh, you can start locally and iterate and so on. And then it, it stays with you all the way to uh, running production quality uh, at large scale. Uh, uh, flight is strongly typed, uh, guaranteeing, you know, more and more compile type errors than runtime errors. Um, and then lastly, it's extensible, or extensibility points at every stage in the execution um, to allow you to, uh, you know, add functionality to the platform that we haven't thought of that are specific to your organization. With that, we'd love to thank you. Uh, we are on Slack, slack.flight.org. Please uh, join and ask questions. And uh, it's off to you, Niels. Thanks, Nathan. Um, yeah, so that, that was a quick uh, intro to Flight, basically. And, and now I want to hop into the Engineering Labs Flight Edition. Um, and I'm going to just give a little bit of context on uh, what we learned building end-to-end -end applications in flight, the we being the three teams that uh, will be giving short lightning talks um, right after I introduce them. So just to give a little more context on, on this, the challenge is, the challenge of this engineering labs is, is in five weeks, um, we task people with building a production ready machine learning application of their choosing using flight as the you know compute workhorse and then having a component a ui component for interacting with whatever application they built um, we kept this challenge very open-ended so teams could pick whatever application ml application they wanted to build and besides using flight all the other technologies in, in the stack were also up to the teams. Um, and so to judge each submission, um, we looked at you know, creativity, how original was the application and the problem statement, um, the execution of the teams uh, from a technical perspective, and then human friendliness in terms of the model UI. Uh, I just want to give a, a big shout out to the three judges um, Samita, Nastia, and Kevin. They are all you know, in the Union AI and flight teams and they helped uh, assess all the different uh, three submissions. Besides Engineering Labs bragging rights, uh, obviously we're you know, giving away um, cash prizes and, and flight swag to the top three uh, finalists. And uh, just to, really quickly say what our internal goal was here is 
you know, there's the core question of how do we make it easier for people to onboard and get started with flight. And so, the, you know, this was a question we asked and I think, you know, this experience with the engineering labs um, gave us an answer. Um, so we took note of all the different various things that were perhaps blockers or were confusing and we're taking that feedback um, and, you know, going back and iterating on the user experience. And uh, yeah, I don't want to take any more time. So the finalists um, are a team artifact, uh, AKA Adorable Unicorns 23. That was the auto-generated name that I had given them uh, at the beginning of the hackathon. Um, Brave Hyenas 2 and Vamos Dali. And yeah, I'd like to hand it off to Team Artifact first. Oh, by the way, uh, as this is happening, um, after the three talks, I will announce who the, the winners are. So first, second, and third place. Good. I was just going to ask if you were going to do that. So awesome. Uh, I've got <laughs> Team Artifact on here. Molly, yeah. did you share your screen yet? Do you need to share your screen? Let me... I need to share my screen. Let me just... All right. Yeah. There we go. I see people from Paris are cheering you on in the Slack <laughs> or in the, um, <laughs> in the chat, I should say. All right, cool. Right. So there we go. That should be your screen. And yep. I'll bring Nils and I off. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you for, for giving me now opportunity to speak about what we did. So um, I speak for Artifact Team, aka Adorable in Constantly 3. So first, uh, very quickly, I will introduce our company, Artifact, then talk about what we implemented for the sake of these engineering labs, and finally, our key learnings about this uh, technology that we discovered. So uh, Artifact, it's a French consulting company employing different tech profiles. So we have consultants, project owners, data scientists, ML engineers, software engineers, data analysts, and so on. So we constitute the team with those different profiles for the sake of this uh, competition. And so uh, that's how What's Cooking Good Looking was born. <laughs> so. Maybe uh, before going into the um, flight implementation, I'll give you a bit of business context. So we got inspired uh, with a project, we, with a client that wanted to keep innovating in the beauty industry. And what you need to know about the beauty industry is that when you want to create a new product, you can have like 18 months uh, between the, the, the moment you decide to create the project and the moment it reaches the market. So you want to innovate, but you want to innovate faster than this. And one possible strategy is instead of creating those projects from scratch, you can just find some indie brands on social media that the pub public already likes and then buy them out. So uh, the problematic that we, that we wanted to resolve is how to detect those new brands in social media posts. And to do that, we implemented a name identity recognition uh, pipeline. So let's dive into it. So we designed a global pipeline uh, in which we wanted to introduce a feedback loop. So let's go in range on this pipeline. First, we scrapped some tweets related to beauty based on a list of keywords. Uh, then we extract uh, entities from those posts. We send them to a labeling tool where a person can uh, check for missed or wrong entities. And then uh, we, we use those lab labeled uh, entities as uh, input to our, to our evaluation task where we compute uh, metrics, uh, classic metrics such as uh, accuracy, precision recall, or whatever. Then we reach this point. Either the, the metrics are good enough and then the pipeline stops or the, the, the metrics are not good enough. And then we need to train a new model based on this data and keep looping on this feedback loop until we reach the green side. If we never reach the green side, we will stop at a maximum iteration, of course. So that's what we wanted to do. 
to do that, we needed to, to deploy a Label Studio a Label Studio instance, Label Studio being the technology we used for annotation. But for the sake of the hackathon, we didn't have the time to like create a whole um, a whole architecture on the cloud and everything, especially when we didn't manage the the flight deployment, the flight sandbox deployment. So we decided to split this work and to focus only on what was evaluated, aka the flight workflows. So that's how we split the work. We did first the workflow of application of the NER model. In a manual part, we, we used those posts into a label studio. And then this output comes into another workflow. And let's go into each of them. So the first workflow uh, is, so we, we apply the NER model to a, fre a fresh Twitter data flow. So what we do is that we get those tweets, we load a model either pre-trained or from our previous trainings, we apply it and we send it to Label Studio. Label Studio is uh, an open source, open source tool that we used that is very cool for labeling, uh, labeling uh, texts. And uh, you know, in, in NLP, it's very, yeah, you have to iterate a lot uh, because only a human has the answer. So you have to put uh, some very easy means to, to make people uh, label faster. When I say people, I, I say uh, business people because they have the answer. So here, for instance, we have a tweet that is loaded here and you can just select the piece of word you want to label as an entity, choose the type of entity and update it. And once you have done all of your, of your tasks, you can just submit it and go into the next part. Next part being the, the NER model uh, training. So that's how we, we split it. So first we load the label studio output. We send those, uh, those annotations into an evaluation component that computes accuracy. And then into this dynamic piece, we're gonna check either if the performance are good enough, then you stop, you go directly to the end. If it's not good enough, you train a new model. And that's how we wanted to implement a feedback loop. If we, if we had more time, we would have done it in a full and singly merged pipeline in which we could we could have introduced a feedback loop. And this feedback loop is very, well, it's key. And we wanted to do that because it's something that we always need in NLP and we wanted to, to make it faster for NLP projects, to, for, for NLP projects to iterate with the business. So that's what we ended uh, in our submission. And Quickly, so now that I have presented what we submitted, uh, I'll give our, our quick uh, learnings about flight. So there are a lot of things that we liked. We all discovered this technology. We never used it before. And uh, my personal two favorites were are the two first points. So I, was, uh, I, I, um, I just wanted to say that we, we were able to uh, submit uh, tasks and workflow very fast. And this is because the SDK and the documentation, the, the public documentation are very intuitive. So that's a very good point for us. And also the debugging process is very smooth because you can run your, your workflow locally before uh, compiling, just like you, you explained earlier, way more, way, uh, way more clear than what I'm, I'm saying right now, but still, when you compare this experience to an experience with, a, for instance, a Kubeflow or a, an Airflow, where you always have to compile everything you do just to test it and send it remotely and test it on the distant server. Well, the development iterations are very long and then, yeah, it's, it's, very, uh, it's becoming very painful to iterate. And really here, we were able to debug everything locally and almost get it from the first uh, strike remotely. And it's very nice. So uh, those are the two first points. And then, uh, yeah, the UI is very intuitive. The graphic representations look good. It's very easy to check for the logs to know how the task done uh, did and everything. And also, uh, yeah, for the system of error management, 
The error messages are very clear in flight environment, so it's very uh, easy to understand what the, what was your mistake in the development and just to correct it very very quick. So that's our the, the thing that we really liked about our experience with flight. And to get a full opinion on it, we still are missing some things because of our lack of experience. But yeah, so uh, first, the, the first point is the deployment because the two CLIs and their associated config lack a bit of documentation and clear how to. So when we implemented the CD that automatically updates the, the, the remote work workflow, we struggled a little bit on it. So that's the first point. And the second point is not like, uh, it's just something that we don't uh, know. Uh, because we use uh, a sandbox that was uh, provided by Union AI, we lack of the ops vision. And to get a full uh, picture on the on this technology, we also know we also need to know how easy it is to maintain it and to and to monitor it and everything. So, yeah, that's about it. I'm happy to take any question now or after. I don't know if there's a session dedicated to it. Yeah, we'll we'll have questions all at the end. And um, okay, but if anybody wants to ask questions, throw them in the chat right now and then we can have that um we'll ask you at the end cool okay all right perfect so uh thank you everyone and welcome to the flight engineering labs from team brave arenas uh i'm ali uh omar can you go to the next screen please awesome yeah so i'm ali abbas jeffrey i'm based currently in munich and working as uh, an engineering consultant at ML Reply, whereas uh, my teammate here, or Abdullahi Yafat Omar, he's based in Nairobi, Kenya, and is a machine learning independent consultant and a freelancer. So uh, our journey basically with flight started with this hackathon. Uh, we got together a bit before the hackathon began to get to know more about flight and understand the framework a bit better and its concepts and to discuss what do we want to achieve with this hackathon. Uh, initially, we decided to implement a very simple test application so as to understand the concepts better and to get our hands dirty with flight. Uh, in this case, we ended up using uh, a simple iris classifier and build the flight workflow around it. It really helped us get a better understanding of how to use flight and gave us a lot of confidence because we integrated some other toolings along with it try to track experiments along with MLflow and then even ended up uh, deploying our model uh, using bent to ml So this was for us a very good intro into flight and its working. And that is what really had our hopes up and we really wanted to test flight to its limits. Uh, yep. So for the hackathon, we decided to create a music genre classifier workflow using flight. Uh, well, the idea was to integrate data ingestion, pre-processing, model training, model inference, all using flight. Uh, these tasks culminated in a very straightforward manner for us uh, using uh, the inbuilt constructs of task and workflow. Uh, for the sake of the hackathon, we decided to focus more towards the engineering side of things and therefore tried to uh, leverage an existing code base and decided to flightify it. Uh, we took inspiration from the work of Validio Valado, who was present once before on this MLOps coffee sessions. Uh, we learned a lot from his uh, podcast and were really inspired by his work and took it to the next level. Uh, yeah. So we really love working with Flight. Uh, I believe it's one of the one of the best MLOps working frameworks besides ZenML and Metaflow that I've worked with. Uh, it just allows you to get started with right away. I think one of the best things about flight was the communication uh, with the flight team. So the team was very active throughout the hackathon. They did a tremendous job running uh, such an active community and were always there throughout the entire duration of the hackathon. So yeah, so it was it was really nice from their end. Uh, yeah, another thing uh, that is worthy of mentioning is the ease of starting to work with flight. Uh, I, it just requires a very simple knowledge of uh, what our two concepts, tasks and workflows, and that's it. It just 
lets you get into the whole pipeline stuff and get your hands dirty with it. Uh, yeah. And another thing that I found as personally as very helpful is the extensive documentation. I think the documentation covers a lot of different simple and complex uh, workflows and you just can easily find inspiration from the sample code that's provided online. Uh, it's just it's just super easy to get into the framework and try to apply your use case to it. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, found as bumpy along the way with the using of the tool was the sandbox. Uh, sandbox deployment was a bit of a hard task for us because we were trying to test out something completely different, a bit a bit complex. Uh, but what was really nice was like already mentioned, the team was always reachable with our queries, even with technical help, and really helped us move step by step along with this challenge. Uh, and another thing that a lot of people over here uh, would agree with, uh, debugging in ML is hard, but debugging ML on Kubernetes gets a bit harder. Uh, there were some times when uh, we wanted to make some things work, we were struggling a bit because there are so many systems in play, and it can get a bit harder to understand where the errors are rooting from. Uh, so that's a bit about our, our journey with Flight. Uh, I would like Omar to present a demo shortly. Basically, our tech stack uh, comprised of Flight for workflow orchestration and Streamlit. So Omar, stage is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Ali, and thank you, everyone, for having us. So this is our, can you hear me? OK. Anyone? Hello? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, but perfect. Go ahead. OK, OK, perfect. This is our architectural overview. This is high level. Uh, so on the left side, we have our data, which we source publicly and is already labeled music file. So we run two flight task pre-process and uh, train. So the pre-process get the audio file and transform into JSON format where we can we can train the model. All this is wrapped under workflow, under flight workflow. Then we build and push our, our image to a GitHub repository. Then later we package it and serialize it to register under Union AI cluster. So in the cluster, we can actually use in the console, we, you can easily um, launch the task individually or the workflow as whole. So as of our as of our code is really now uh, still dirty somehow. So we are cleaning it up, but our application is locally, and we are applying we are to, uh, we are applying to make sure it it goes online in Heroku, inshallah. So to go quick on our on our application that is running locally. Um, this is our application. Oh yeah, by the way, this is the workflow, uh, the console workflow, and it's pretty nice as Ali put it and all um, the previous uh, speakers. It's really intuitive and easy to just launch easily. And also you can launch it, uh, you can launch it uh, using a schedule, automatically scheduling. And so this is our application where we can just load uh, any file, for example, a test file, and then we just predict our application and it predicts the, uh, the journal that you are sending to. It's running, it's running. Hmm. Yeah, here we go. You're listening to classical music. And yeah, uh, to go back on the flight cons uh, console, you can easily see your uh, version, workflow version. Uh, the, this is the latest, but you can see the rest. And then this is the input values of the workflows, of the workflow, of your workflow. Yeah, and then, thank you. All right, awesome. That was... Perfect. I'm going to bring up the next and final competitor. Thank you, fellas, for jumping on. Uh, Matthew, where are you? There he is. All right. I'll pop out those guys. Okay. What do you got for us, man? Okay. So, hi, everyone. My name is Matthew, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the our team's Vamos Dali project for the hackathon 
and the project's name is Destination Similarity. So, oh, hang on. I'm trying out this, this stream. Okay. Um, so, a roadmap about what we'll talk about today. I will do a brief introduction about the problem that we're trying to solve, and then I'll present our solution. The solution will be divided into four different parts. It's the data set extraction, pre-processing, the model training, and the serving. Then I'll present an overall project structure. And finally, I'll present a conclusion and future works. So um, for those who don't know, our team, the Vamos Dali team, we are a group of engineers from Hub. That it's a, that it's a travel agency and that sells pretty much um, travel packages to all over the world. So we sell plane tickets and hotels. Um, so we are a travel agency. And this market is in constant expansion. And it's very, in the, it's, um, there's a lot of room for technological improvements to use technology to improve the customer's experience and our own experience developing new projects. So what problem did you try to solve? That's our pro the problem statement that we defined was with a huge possibility of places to see in the world, where should an user be recommended to go given their preference? So it's pretty much a destination similarity problem, given a place to go, where else, or user preference in a way, what else can, uh, or other places that the user can go. So the scope of our problem is that the recommended destinations will be cities. Not only that, they will be Brazilian cities. So Herb is a an, is an company from Brazil. I'm Brazilian. All, everyone on the team is Brazilian. So it made sense for us to use Brazilian cities. And no personal user data should be used, shall be used in this process. So we will only use data from the cities itself or other types of data. And with that in mind, we came up with this solution for the problem. That is, using public information about Brazilian cities, such as history, climate, attractions, and activities, we create a product that, given a city the user likes, suggests future destinations based on similarity among cities. So it pretty much, it pretty much retrieves data, public data from the cities and try to, given a, a city that you liked that you say, okay, I want to visit sim cities similar to that one. It computes what cities are most similar to that city. That's our solution. And how did we do that? Well, first we had to retrieve data from those cities. So we had a data set extraction. To extract the data from the cities, we used the Wikimedia Foundation tools. Wikimedia is the foundation that is responsible for Wikipedia, Wikivoyage, and we wanted to extract text from these pages. So to do that, first we constructed a base data from Wikidata, that it's a, it's a data, it's a very huge database with a lot of different informations that connect each other and tells and informs like what cities are from each place. It's a very comprehensive and very complete database, and we use that database as a source, source of truth to retrieve names, the names of the cities, and links for the cities for different Wiki, Wikimedia pages. And using this information, we used, we used Wikimedia's REST API to retrieve the data that we actually needed to use, so summary, climate, and etc. So we retrieve data from two main sources from the Portuguese Wikipedia and for the English Wikivoyage. It's very important to notice that the base data had about 5,700 cities and Brazilian cities, and but only about 400 cities had pages on Wikivoyage. And for our project, we only used the, the those 400 cities because we wanted to use a very comprehensive and a very complete data set. And since a lot of cities had just a Wikipedia page, a very short Wikipedia page, we thought it would make a very unbalanced, unbalanced data set. So we only use the Wikivoyage pages. And with the data set ready, we needed to pre-process the data because the data was a lot of text, a lot of text with um, a lot of 
as a, uh, not necessary things to unnecessary things to to create the model. So the first step after the data after retrieving the data set was pre-process the data. So it was very simple. We only had to lowercase the data, remove subwords, remove white space and other necessary characters. And the very important step was a language translation step. We actually, as we some, as we see later, we used a Bertin Bau model, and this model is a transformer used to to create embeddings for for Portuguese texts. So the language translation step was to actually translate English texts from Wikivoyage to Portuguese texts. So that was a very important step on the pre-processing of data. With the data pre-processed and translated, we could finally create the model. And well, how did we make this model? We want to make we wanted to make that the computer try to see how cities are similar. What's a better way to do that than creating embeddings for the cities to create vectors that represent those cities? So that's what we do. So that's, that's what we did. We get, we got the, the data set, we clean the data set, and then we transform this data set, this bunch, these loads and loads of text into embeddings for each city. So that's the modeling part. We, we got the clean cities data and we passed through the Bertinbau transformer to create different city, vec different vectors representing the city's history or geography or attractions or summary. Um, you can see we only represented history, geography, attractions and activities on this slide, but we actually could use and have used other, other, other sections of the text, like the summary and such. So this could we used a lot of different attributes of the city to create this representation. And after creating the represent the vectors, the different vectors of different sections, we computed the mean, the mean between every single vector to create a mean representation of the city. And with that, we ended up with, an, with embeddings of each city. And with those embeddings, we could compute the similarity. We can use, you can, we can actually say, look, Given a uh, given a city, this is the, the most similar cities that you can visit, and this was a simple simple k nearest neighbors algorithm. We computed the Euclidean distance between a given city input and said, "Oh, look, this is the k nearest cities that that the model computed for this city." So that's how we infer the next destinations. Uh, I actually added a GIF here, and that's sadly not working, so it would only show this print, but as you can see here, you, in the Streamlit model, you say what state, a state and a, and a city, and you say how many recommendations you want to get, and in the, and the Streamlit model shows what cities you should visit, and a brief summary of the cities. Again, this was supposed to be a GIF, but I use Restreams Restreams transmission, it's not up here, sorry. But anyway, um, this is the overall project structure. Um, these two first blocks, these generate data set block, block and build embeddings block, these are actually flight workflows. And each block, each gray, gray block, like get base data or scrape wiki, this is actually um, this is actually a flight task. So these, these two blocks are, are our main flight structure for the project. In the first block, we generate the data set, we generate the data, and the, in the second block, we generate the embeddings. And in the final block, the app, blo the app block is the Streamlit app. This, the app retrieves the base data and retrieves the embeddings and computes the neighbors given on user input and formats the output like the image that I shown in this in the previous slide. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about flight. I want to talk how flight helped us to develop this this project. Um, there were four key points that I think that are worth mentioning. The first one is that the data scraping process was embarrassingly parallel. Like if we scraped data from Wiki Voyage and scraped data from Wiki Wikipedia, those two scraping processes were not dependent of each other. So flight made those tasks concurrently 
automatically for us, concurrent automatically for us. So this was a very huge improvement on, on processing power. On my machine, it took about an hour to, to scrape the entire data. And on, on flight, it took about like 30 minutes, 12 minutes. It was a very huge difference. And I'm pretty sure that the processing power of, of the Kubernetes cluster also helped, but definitely the, the, the parallelism, the concurrency helped a lot too. And another important point is that Wikimedia pages can change over time. But if we define the launch plans to retrain the model monthly, the, the flight, uh, flight guarantees that the model will be updated constantly. So we don't need to like scrap, scrap everything every manually. We can make everything automatically and update embeddings automatically too. But if the, if the data set does not change, we do not need to retrain everything. So we enter the third point. If they don't change, we don't need to retrain and we can use flights ca caching system to avoid reprocessing everything. So we don't need to spend money on Kubernetes um, retraining everything. And finally, the training could be the fit for more resources. We actually wanted to use GPU in our, in our, in our project and it was very easy to adapt the system to use a GPU system. Um, we only had to update the, the, the task decorator. We only had to update like one line of code on the Docker file and requ requesting those resources to the server was very trivial. So it was very, very, it was a very easy point to, to use. Um, and that's pretty much it. As a conclusion, this was a very complex and supervised machine learning problem, but Flight helped a lot. It, it enabled a very seamless experimentation deployment process. As future works, this, this problem is far from done. We will probably tackle it again soon. And as future works, we, we could have used more cities, the cities that we extracted, or even better use cities from all over the world, or retrieve some kind of user feedback to evaluate the model, to see that if the model is doing okay or not. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Patrick, Renat, and Sergio. They were the others, the other members of this group, and they helped a lot. I'm here today representing all of us, and thanks. Wow, that, this is awesome. Um, thanks, all three teams. Yeah, I looked at the submissions. You know, I didn't judge them, but yeah, it was really cool to see what um, all you, all y'all have. Uh, Built with it. And, you know, we did add support, we did offer support, but like for the most part, all of you, you know, did all the work and figured out, you know, how to use flight. Um, and by design, we didn't want to do too much, too much like spoon feeding, you know, per se. Um, and yeah, the results are really cool. So with that, uh, thanks everyone for sticking around and, and for your attention. Um, I know the, the three team members, uh, the three teams are anxious to see the results. Um, and so since I don't know how to use Excel anymore, um, I got the results, I threw them into a Jupyter Notebook, um, loaded up the data from, <laughs> from the spreadsheet, and um, we'll done drum roll. So the top, the top team is Vamos Dale. Uh, the second team is Team Artifact, and third place is Brave Hyenas. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll circle back with everyone um, around the logistics of the swag and, and whatnot. Um, and we just wanted to say this has been, you know, an amazing experience for us. Uh, thank you for hopping on board, uh, pun intended. And uh, we did want to encourage all of the teams to, you know, like the Flight Lab repo is open source. You can keep working on it. We're actually gonna, uh, over the next few weeks, merge those PRs into the Flight Lab main repo. Um, we'll also feature your work in our docs. So, um, you know, look out for uh, pings from our side to, you know, get more information, make sure, you know, you and your companies are well represented there. Um, and with that, uh, yeah, thank you for participating.
This is super cool. And congratulations, everyone. We're going to finish it there, but hopefully <laughs> you all are, are excited about how that went. I know this has been like, it's been incredible for us to see. I've kind of been standing uh, on the sidelines and just watching you all and like really hard work. I'm so thankful for you to like have done this and now present here. And uh, I'm trying as hard as I can to get you all presenting in other areas. So look out for my pings also. And that's all for now. We will be in touch. We'll get a hold of you soon enough. Thanks everybody for joining us. Feel free if you have any questions. Uh, we went a little bit over time. So if you have any questions, please reach out to the respective people in the... Um, in the MLOps community Slack. And with that, we're gonna end it. Thanks again. We'll see you all later.